Welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecast, and strategies. Hello, I'm Michael Bull. Thank you for being with us. This show is brought to you by Bull Realty. If you'd like to sell senior housing or any type of commercial property or a land or multifamily in the Southeast U.S. or in Atlanta, reach out to me directly. My email is michael at bullrealty.com. And there is a reason I mentioned uh, senior housing. We have a big senior housing uh, group here as part of, of our firm, but we're going to talk about senior housing today, and I think it's a interesting uh, sector to talk about because a lot of people are interested in it because kind of the demographics, right? We think we feel like the baby boomers are going to be getting up in age soon, and and there's going to be a lot more demand. But we've also had some struggles in the senior housing group. You know, we had the sector, we had the uh, uh, COVID and all the issues there, and then of course, like every sector, kind of the uh, rapid rising interest rates uh, a year ago were kind of stifling the folks. And now we're starting to see activity really pick back up again. But what's going on in the industry? Let's find out. Please welcome my guest. It's Lisa McCracken. She's head of research and analytics with the National Investment Center for Seniors Housing and Care. We in the industry are, uh, call them Nick. <laughs> the Knights say it's Nick. Pretty. Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. Yeah, Nick and I see we go by both, but thank you for having us today. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on. And, uh, I think the first thing that might be on my uh, listeners and viewers' minds about senior housing today is how are operations going? How are these properties overall and kind of performing around the country now? Yeah, well, I, mean, I can speak to nationally what we're seeing. Um, you know, the, some of the key fundamentals that we track, obviously, are occupancy. You know, that that's the root of, of, you know, overall operating performance and then can comment a little bit on margins. But we have seen pretty consistent over the last 11 quarters improvement in, in those operating fundamentals. So occupancy hit a low in our sector in early 2021. Since then, we have seen gradual increases um, and really across the past year, pretty record level increases. So we take a look at absorption and that basically says, you know, how quickly are new units that come on the market filling up? And we've had a couple quarters here consecutively of record level absorption. So we project that probably second quarter, maybe third quarter this year, that we're going to be back to the pre-pandemic occupancy levels for senior housing. Now, we're seeing some variation by market. There's some markets that are already well surpassed that early 2020 figure. But um, overall, as an industry, we are seeing that recovery. We're seeing a little quicker pace of recovery on the assisted living side of things compared to independent living. Um, but both are continuing that upward trajectory. So we're very optimistic from a market fundamental standpoint. Um, you know, certainly facing some of the headwinds that are pressuring margins, and I would say labor wages being a, a among the top there. But yeah, you know, we're looking ahead to, with a good bit of optimism to this year. That's good. And so your occupancy kind of getting back to kind of pre-pandemic levels. What what percentage occupancy is that? Yeah, so the first quarter of 2020, which is what we see as our baseline for pre-pandemic, was an 87.1% um, um, occupancy. So um, not that that's our North Star, and we actually project that we're going to be in a position to exceed that. But, you know, that that's obviously a line in the sand that many people are eager to cross. And then we do know, again, that there's a number of, of organizations with portfolios that are, have surpassed their pre-pandemic levels. So I think a lot of it depends on maybe on where you are, uh, what your um, uh, distribution of different properties by age, by different, you know, um, segment looks like. But 87.1 is really the first line in the sand. And then we're looking to exceed that. And our projections show that, that we're going to do that in a pretty yeah. healthy way. Well, you guys do a great job of, of tracking and the senior housing market. Thank you. I know we're, we're subscribers to your, your services here. Um, and we talked about demand at kind of improving and, and, and occupancy improving. Um, what do you expect, you know, moving forward, I guess, you know, new supply levels has, uh, what's the trend there? Has that adjusted lately? <laughs> well, um, it's adjusted downward, I would say pretty similar to what we're seeing in some other, um, you know, commercial real estate segments, but you know, we, we've seen pretty record lows and, and not, we haven't seen records, uh, in terms of new construction starts this low in over a decade. 
Um, and the other thing that we've found too is that, again, you know, we're not unique to this, but the construction cycle has lengthened. We know all the construction pressures in terms of some of the supply chain issues, but they're having their own set of labor challenges and, and so forth with getting the skilled workers. But on average, it's a 29 month development cycle from the time you know, shovels are in the ground till those first residents are moving in. So if you take a look at what we know the construction starts to be these days, which are significantly reduced levels, a lot of because of the capital environment, um, and then couple that with that 29 month on average cycle, we've got a pretty good sense of, of knowing over the next couple of years, we're still going to be in this generally depressed market as it relates to new construction. So we know that there's a number of people that are in the planning mode, sort of on the sidelines waiting to pull the trigger. I think some of that will happen once we start to see some of the capital environment improve a bit. But um, so, yeah, we've got this interesting dynamic where, you know, you mentioned the baby boomers and the aging population. So that demand is there on our doorstep and we're starting to feel that now. But yeah, we're seeing record low levels of supply come in. So we're going to have this pretty notable gap really over the next several years. And, and we're projecting that, um, you know, if all of those new developments that are in the pipeline right now come to fruition, we're still going to have a, a sizable gap really out through the year 2026. So it's, it's some interesting unique dynamics. I think that are unique to senior housing. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly, I guess, good news to some of the existing uh, facilities, maybe less new con new supply coming and they come in and competing with them. One of the things you, you mentioned uh, was was labor, and uh, I want to see what the trends there because it seems like in the in the last couple of years, folks have been having trouble getting anybody to work anywhere. Uh, but especially, it seems like it was seemed like it was tougher even in, in senior housing. What's what's the trend yeah. you're seeing now? Yeah, so there's there's a number of things at play there. So you know, if you know, we often get lumped into maybe healthcare or sometimes multifamily. We're a bit of a hybrid of the two two of them because we've got the housing and the care component, but you know, we obviously lost a great deal of the workforce once the pandemic hit. And our sector has not recovered at the same level as a number of other what I'll use just healthcare sectors. Um, and, you know, in terms of gaining back those jobs. So, you know, we're making progress. And I would say, you know, everybody would agree we are in a better place now than we were one year ago, two years ago. Uh, we've got fewer um, groups that are dependent on agencies. So that's still out there and that's very, very costly. But um, so I would say we're in a better spot, but the, the big sticker is the wages as well. And that's one of the things that we track is the assisted living wage growth year over year. And we had, I think that the peak that we had hit was around nine, 10% two years ago. And that has started to come down and we, we were anticipating that continued, um, you know, downward trajectory, but we did get some revised year end 2024 three numbers that show that, that we had a 7% year over year increase in assisted living wages. And you can imagine that, that that's going to pressure margins a bit. So I would say that that's the one thorn in our side, if you will, from an industry that we're going to have to really continue to tackle recruitment, retention. Um, you know, how can we try to mitigate to the best of our abilities, the impact of wages and other, let's say perhaps agency calls on, on that NOI. Yeah. It seems like such a huge, important part of the senior housing is the uh, uh, the folks working there, right? And makes the the difference. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. They're they're fantastic groups, and yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, um, it, it, the term here has been used a good bit, but you know, you've got people that really um, are passionate about what they do and committed to that space, and I think that that's a big recruitment point, quite frankly, but. Um, you know, I, I think we need to do just a good a job on the retention side of things. So I know it's all hands on deck and we've improved and made strides. I think we've learned a lot in recent years, but yeah, you know, the other thing that I would just say on that too, is, is when you look at the demographics at the same time, we've got this aging population, a lot of people exiting the workforce. Some of those are our current employees and, um, you know, so we've got some numbers challenges. You know, we know that we generally as a population are not replenishing generations. So I, I think this is going to be one that's going to really force us to look at some workforce models long term and where can people age in place um, in a lower acuity setting. Technology can help, you know, in a number of those things as well. It doesn't replace people. But there are some things that we can do to mitigate some of these workforce pressures um, above and beyond just, I would say, the historical playbook. 
Yeah, good point. And uh, I'd like to see more technology used in, in a lot of these senior housing properties. We sell a number of them and uh, from very nice, brand new, big ones to to medium and, and, and older. And I, you know, I'd like to see more technology. Um, I want to ask you too, Lisa. So we're talking with Lisa McCracken and she uh, is with Nick NIC uh, talking about the senior housing. Um, are you seeing much uh, distress situations in, in senior housing yet? And, and how are, are lenders and borrowers kind of getting through that? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple kinds of distress and, and you know, we, we often try to break this conversation down. So there's obviously the financial distress where you've got a lot of groups sort of coming, um, you know, due to day in terms of low maturities in an environment that they did not anticipate. Um, and so you're either putting forth some equity and or taking a haircut um, and terms are not the same. So, so you've got some of that, what I would call financial distress that are neat, that's needing to be worked through, um, you know, and, and banks may be willing to extend, but the terms, is that going to work for you and pencil out? So I think there's a certain degree of financial distress that, that is out there. Um, but then I think that there is, um, and again, I think that that's going to get worked through. I mean, you know, that, that's the reality of it. You just, I think, you know, we're working through some of that now and um, different agencies and, and lenders are working through that with restructuring or whatever they need to do. And, and I think it's a small per percentage when you look at, um, you know, we often follow the TREP data in terms of some of the delinquent loans and, and they are obviously on the debt side of things, but uh, senior housing is around 4%, which is a little better than a number of others. It's higher than the multifamily category, which they fall into. But those are the, the types of numbers that we're seeing some delinquent no loans here. So there's the financial distress. And then the other thing, uh, and this ties to some of the inventory conversation, is a little bit of property level distress. So as we sit here today, 44% of senior housing properties are 25 years or older. And when you look at that proportion of percentage, when you've got little and limited new inventory coming in, in terms of those younger properties, you're going to have um, that number grow in the next few years. So um, I, I think because there's limited new competition coming in, I think some of those older, more um, dated properties are probably going to be cushioned a little bit here um, in the next few years and still be bringing in and meeting the demand in their local market. But It'll be interesting to see what those um, look like long term. Can you, you know, reinvest and, and reposition them, or is it a really old building that you're going to have a really hard time getting the rates that you need to out of it? So, so that's a segment of of the housing group that we're paying attention to. And the other, the third one I'll just mention is, you know, you've got some of the, uh, you know, a bit of the distress, but it's not broken. So, you know, we know there were some properties that came on the market when COVID was, you know. Um, impacting us significantly, and they just may have had a little difficulty with filling up. So those are very attractive, quite frankly, um, at the right price point uh, to to some buyers. So those are not distressed and broken, but um, so again, there's a couple different categories. But yeah, there, there's you certainly do. some out there. I think that we're going to work through. Yeah, well, I like the way you categorize the distress. Yeah, you know, one of the probably fits in one of those categories. I'd refer to as operational distress. Uh, we're seeing some of that where they just don't really have good operations, and 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 as as you know, and our listeners know, they're in the industry. You know, senior housing is uh, uh, very much a business, right? And you, and, uh, and the operations need to be. And we've we've got one now that uh, you know this that people can buy well under replacement costs. It's beautiful, and it's just had some operational distress. So somebody right. with good that knows how to operate come in and, and get some real wins right now. Hands down. We, and we've seen some of those examples where those properties change hands and they just, you know, skyrocket to definitely more optimal performance. So, you know, there is variation in terms of, you know, some of that operator execution. Yeah, and, you know, if you're looking at the cover and saying something's not adding up here, you know, these numbers should be a little bit better than they are, particularly given the market fundamental improvement that we're seeing. Um, yeah, you know, it could be on the operator side of things. So, um, I, I think that that's something that as a sector, we need to take a look at before the next development cycle, because I think once the capital does free up, when you look at those demand dynamics, we're going to be going through, you know, once that flip switches, by the way, that switch flips, we're going to be in a pretty significant growth cycle. So how are we going to prepare ourselves from a um, just inventory of high quality operator standpoint? So I think that that's a bit of a 
uh, introspective um, uh, assessment that we need to be doing right now as a sector to position ourselves to be, you know, solid and successful, you know, in a few years once we really hit that next mm-hmm. significant growth cycle. Yeah. Well, Lisa, before we, we let you go, can you provide us maybe some tips or strategies for operators uh, right now to think about maybe a few items to, to be on their top of the list to maybe improve uh, their results? Yeah, actually, um, that's a good question. We In our uh, Nick Insider newsletter that's coming up this week, we have an article on this successful owner-operator relationship. I, I think a lot of it is just making sure that you are on the same page from the beginning. So what are what are the investor goals, the owner goals? What are the operator goals? And, and how do you define that success? I think um, outcomes and measurement, being on the same page with that. So you're not looking at different data points, different measurements, um, and, and just having that collaborative understanding. So we talked about technology before and there are, you know, the business is more complex today. So there are potentially investments that need to be made, whether it's an aging inventory, whether it is in some of these technology enhancements. So, you know, with whose shoulders does that fall on? Is that the operator? Is that the owner? Is it that a, a shared investment and cost? What does that look like? So I think the most successful owner operator relationships we see are, are incredibly collaborative and they are from day one because they've do, done their homework and due diligence. So, um, and that's not to say everything is, you know, just roses and unicorns and perfect, but they work through the difficult things and and um, I think that's to be expected. So um, again, you know, we're seeing consolidation on the operator side of things. I think that that's given us some more concentrated scale, which I think can very much help when you've got, you know, some of that geographic density. So I think that we're moving in the right direction on that front as well. Yeah, well, that's some good tips. Uh, one of the things that uh, we see that uh, really helps some of these operators is really have more proactive marketing, right? And not just sitting there waiting for somebody to walk in the door, but really get out there. Do you have some ideas for operators to, to be more proactive, what they might do? Well, so, you know, you need to be savvy. First of all, you need to know your market. You need to know your customer, um, whether that's the adult child who maybe have a, has an influence that's impacting uh, mom or dad's decision or, or the, the senior themselves. But, you know, we talked about it, um, technology. Data analytic, analytics is so huge in that space these days. And everything from, you know, geofencing and, you know, looking to see where people go and how you target that marketing so I think you've got to have sophistication at that level and understand the decision-making patterns um, of these individuals. So, you know, one of the things we can't do is we can't get lazy and look at the demographics and say, oh, you know, look at how many people are turning, you know, 75 or 80 every day and get lazy and assume that because, you know, they've got a need that they will come because I think there are more choices than ever. So, um, and I think we've got a savvier customer than ever because they have more information at their fingertips. So. You know, how can you be savvy in your marketing, but also how can you be, you know, a partner? We've seen some that have great success in just being an educator. And um, because you are that source of information, then they come look to you for their housing and, and potentially care needs down the road. So I think it's taking that holistic view. And um, again, you know, marketing and sales occupancies are our engine. So we, we need to fuel that. And during difficult times, you don't cut that back. I think you double down. So, yeah, I would agree. I think that that's, you know, definitely up there, you know, number one, number two for sure. Yeah, I like your idea there of being being an educator, provide information, right, and get it out there in the social media uh, aspects, you know, of Facebook or, you know, wherever these adult children or, or maybe the seniors are, right? So they kind of see you as an educator and, and know your facility, right? Yeah, enlightened marketing is often the term that is used. So, you know, what, what are you providing for them. And that can often be a hook because it's a very valuable resource. And it might be a caregiver piece that you you put out there for, again, the adult children. And then the, they then they think of you, um, again, you know, for when potentially mom or dad needs some support. So I'm a big fan of that approach for sure. Yeah. Well, look, everyone, Nick is a great organization and, and you guys have a event coming up in September in uh, DC, a convention, right? Yeah, so our annual fall conference is the third week in D.C., so that always draws a nice balance of we've got operators, we've got capital folks, investors, we've got um, services companies, vendors. So, it you know, we, we get a few thousand individuals to that, and, and D.C. is always a hot spot, too. 
So we're really excited to be there in September this year. So we hope you all can join us. That's great. Well, we'll definitely be there. So there's brokers there too that sell senior housing properties and and, and land and land for development. And then uh, and and everyone, hey, check out uh, their site. It's nick.org. That's n i c dot org because there's some information there that the public can access uh, about the industry, right? Uh, as, actually, the vast majority on that website, if not 100%, I'll go with 99.9% is accessible to everyone. So, you know, we really try to put forth some, you know, insights into the data and some really good pieces for all of you to be informed and to make solid decisions. So it's it's free, nick.org. We've got actually a new website that we'll be launching here probably within a month. But either you can go in and easily navigate the latest uh-huh. research and data on the industry. That's great. Lisa McCracken, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for having us. All right. And thanks for joining us around the country. And hey, if you've got a senior housing property and you want to have a consultant come in and look at what you're marketing, how your property is performing, what demand should be, uh, you know, we can we can come in and do that for you. Or if you want to know what your property would bring, if you're a lender or borrower owner, you want to know what your property would bring on, on the market, and yeah, we can share, uh, we can get some information and share that uh, answer with you. So until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh, and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show. America's Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Bullet Realty. For commercial brokerage sales and leasing in the Southeast U.S., contact our show host by email at michael at bullrealty.com. By Commercial Agent Success Strategies, 21 incredible one-hour agent training videos. Learn more at commercialagentsuccess.com. And by Lument. For senior housing, health care, and multifamily financing, visit Lumet. Com. For more podcasts and videos, subscribe and visit CREshow.com.